Our proud to present Emmett Mehta, who's, glad, who's uh, been willing to come out to California to talk to us this evening. So, really you, tough decision. I, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> the horrible weather we have I know. here. Yeah, so I guess we could all just welcome Emmett cool. Mehta for his great talk. Thanks. Cool. Um, yeah, thank you to Jake. Thank you to everyone for uh, bringing me out here. So um, I want to talk to you about this rise of young atheists, but uh, let's make sure the sound works and everything. And let me play this video for you, and let's just see if it's amusing enough, just because I like it. So there you go. comedian's name is Hari Kondabolu. Hilarious. Um, so this is, um, like I said, it's really fun to be here, especially because if I'm not here, I'm teaching high school math. So this is a totally welcome uh, break from that. Um, so the, one of the things, um, I don't know how many of you read my website. Um, if you do, thank you. Um, but one of the things I did several years ago is I started visiting a whole bunch of Christian churches and I wrote this book called I Sold My Soul on eBay. That's a whole nother story and I'm not going to talk about that. But one of the things that happened as a result of that is I visited all these Christian churches and I wrote about this and I started talking about what happens when an atheist who's never really been to church before visits churches. And so one of the things that happened is I got this email from this guy. And he says, hey, I'm a college student. I go to a really Christian college, like totally Christian college. And every year we try to bring people to our school whose beliefs totally differ from that of the student body. So a few years ago, we brought in a feminist. <laughs> and then, then a year before, we brought in a Democrat. And we figured, why not bring in an atheist? Um, so yeah, can you come to our school and talk about your book? Um, P.S. I'm an atheist too. I'm also the president of the Honors College. So I guess this guy's story was his dad taught at the Christian college. He gets free tuition for going there. So he figured, okay, why not just go to college, suck it up for a few years and deal with the Christian stuff, and then graduate and go do whatever the heck he wants to do. Um, and in the meantime, only, I mean, realize if they find out he's an atheist, he would be expelled because you got to sign one of those honor codes and go to chapel and all that. So only like two friends of his who were, he was really close with and one professor knew he was an atheist. So I got a chance to meet them after this talk. And one of the girls that uh, was a good friend of his said, you know, she's Christian. She teaches at a Sunday school. And, you know, because I was a teacher too, but I teach at a public school, we, we started talking about that. And she said that at the Sunday school, they basically give her the curriculum. They tell her, this is what you have to teach on this day. And then she gets very little leeway in how she presents it to like the eight-year-olds that she worked with. But one of the days, they gave her a stack of gingerbread men. And they said, we want you to give these to the eight-year-olds and have them draw what a Christian looks like. And she's like, that's weird. Like, how, how do you know what a Christian? They don't all look the same. That's silly. Um, and then they're like, uh-huh, here's some more gingerbread men. And then have the kids draw what a non-Christian looks like. <laughs> yeah, 
exactly. And she's like, this is a horrible idea because you can't just look at someone and figure out if they're atheist or Christian or whatever. You've got to talk to them. You've got to have a conversation and get to know them. And she's trying to explain this, but they're eight. Like, what are they going to do? So she saved for me uh, what a couple of these kids drew. So I want to share with you, this is what a Christian looks like to this eight-year-old. I just want to point out, it has a banana in its hand. It's like, it knows it's the atheist's worst nightmare. And then, <laughs> it has nice clothes, all colored in, tucked in apparently. I love God. Um, holding a cross, freckles, combed hair, really nice. Okay, so this is what a good Christian man looks like or something. Okay, same kid, here's what a non-Christian looks like. Work. That's... Okay, so let's dissect this for a second. First of all, the clothes aren't even colored in because we all just walk around naked. Um, he ripped off the sleeves of his shirt. Um, he has tattoos, but they're so bad they're sticking out of his body. There's drugs in his hand. He's smoking, I don't know what that is, piercings down the side of his face. Um, I don't know if you could see the word bubble. It says, cussing, God isn't real. Um, hair is all over the place. I think I'm mostly offended by the unibrow more than anything else. <laughs> but okay, this is an eight-year-old. Here's the thing, I really don't think this kid's parents or his pastor, no one's sitting this kid down and saying, this is what a Christian looks like, this is what an atheist looks like. But this eight-year-old is picking this up from somewhere. And maybe he's going to church and getting a sense of this, or maybe Sunday school is doing it, I don't know. But somewhere he's getting the sense that if you're Christian, you're really good, you're wholesome. If you're not Christian, and mind you, that's not atheist. That's just a non-Christian. You are everything that's bad to this kid. And the problem is this child is probably going to grow up, go to high school, go to college with people who are not Christian. And that's like the image they have in their head. And like it's not far, I mean, I know maybe this is a bit of an exaggeration, but it's not that far from the truth that when, an, I mean, how many of you have gotten to know somebody really well who is religious, and the second they find out you're an atheist, their first response is, oh, but I thought you were a good person. Like, that's the gingerbread man they're looking at. Like, they, they think you're supposed to be all these bad things. So the problem is you have, and you guys as college students, whoever's members of AHA here, you know like this is part of the thing you have to combat against. Um, if you do like the ask an atheist anything, like you get a lot of people asking where do you get morals from? Like how do you live a good happy life? Because that's kind of what they're expecting. And you have to combat that. When it gets really hard though is when you're in high school and you're like 14, 15, and maybe, I don't know, how many of you became an atheist if you were religious? How many of you became an atheist around that age, 14-ish? A good chunk of you. How many uh, became atheists at a younger age than that? A bunch more? Okay. And older than that? So m by far, m uh, most of you were talking high school age or younger when you uh, at least identified as an atheist. So you're meeting a lot of people who are just forming their religious sense. They're forming what it is to not you know, to be friends with someone who's not of your faith. And it's annoying because this is the image they have. And so you start meeting a lot of people who get a sense of atheist as a really bad person. So what I want to talk about is how high schoolers, more than anyone else, probably need our support when it comes to this sort of thing and how we can help them and what they've had to go through. So I want to play a video for you that shows a young high school girl who's basically going up against everything, going up against all the people at her school, including her teachers, going up against her city. It seems like everybody is against her, and she is the sole voice of reason in this community. Who am I talking about? Jessica. No, I'm not talking about Jessica Alquist. And isn't that sad that I'm talking about someone else? But I'm talking about another high school girl who went through a lot of crap several years ago um, and while her story probably didn't get a lot of attention, at least because blogs weren't that big of a deal and you don't, it was harder to spread news about atheism even five, six years ago, this happened back then. And amazingly enough, uh, 2020, I believe, covered it. So I'm going to play a clip from that 2020 segment. I didn't think they had religion 
in the sport. But when it came to basketball, they were credited before and after practices and they were credited during games. And, you know, playing was a tradition for them, and that's what they said. Even the other team joins in. And from the standards, school officials too, says Nicole. All the teachers that work at that school and the administration have their heads down there saying we're going to credit the kids. Coach has his head down. It's a thing that everyone does. It was uncomfortable for Nicole because she's an atheist. So did you say, no, I'm an atheist? I yeah. Do. Well, I told the coach, I was like, oh, I don't believe in God, I'm an atheist. So he's like, we've got our walk in there. Nicole said, once she said she was an atheist, your relationship with the other kids changed. Oh, uh, yeah. Students called her names, she said. You know, they would call me Dove Worshipper. I walked on all those people would laugh at me. They would look at me really weird and stare at me down. Then she says, teachers joined in. Mm -hmm. What was they said? This is a Christian country in the field, and they did when a kid's hear a teacher say when she goes to the bathroom, I hate that girl, what are you telling the kids in the school? That's a gang, man. Religious gang. School administrators kicked Nicole off the basketball team. They said she was bad for team morale and that she'd stolen another student's sneakers. Did you take the other girl? No, I borrowed it from her. And people saw me give it back to her and, and she said thank you. You were late to practice nearly every day. Actually, I was early to practice every day, and I ran my laps before the coach got there. A year later, Nicole was allowed back on the team. This time, when the prayer started, Nicole stayed outside the circle. If I just stood outside, I just said, pleasure would be done. Without the under guard. Without the under guard. The next school day, she was suspended. Fearing for their daughter's safety at school, Nicole's parents decided to homeschool all three of their kids. In place of sports, Nicole now focuses more time on music. She taught herself to play classical piano. And she joined her dad and brother to start a family and they're getting paid gig. I missed school, but I don't want to go back to that school. I tried to go back to that school for two days and I couldn't handle it. And there was a new kid there, so he's like, oh, I heard about you. You're that dirty little troublemaking atheist. So for now, Nicole's dreams are on hold. So here's the thing, um, that, that happened, that happens to a person. And if that happened now, I mean, imagine what we could do. I mean, there would be people on our side, there would be people protesting or doing whatever. They would write letters to the administration. Um, and I'll talk about Jess Galquist later. But this happened at a time before we had our networks in place. This is before there were a lot of high school, there, were, there weren't a lot of college atheist groups around. Um, so she didn't have a lot of support, and they're, they're not kidding. She, be, she started homeschooling. Now, here's the good news. Um, she actually, uh, let me preface this. There's a book called The Good News Club. It's about a Christian club. It's out now. It's by Catherine Stewart. She actually mentions this girl, Nicole. Her last name is Smolkowski. But for every Nicole, there are perhaps thousands who quietly join the prayer circle and mumble the words. Uh, many students praying at their sporting endeavors are, thus, are themselves non-theists or members of other religious traditions. They know the locker room is no place for dissent and that a refusal to participate could easily be construed as a sign of lack of commitment. Basically, you have to pray to play. I mean, this is an issue. This goes on across the country. And only now are we kind of getting better at noticing this when it happens, finding out about it, and then combating it where it happens. Um, so I was fortunate enough at least when all this stuff went down, um, I got a chance to meet Nicole. Anyone know where that is? That's the opening of the Creation Museum in Kentucky, which Nicole attended because the one thing she wanted to do, even though she wasn't at school anymore, is she wanted to become active. And she figured opposing the Creation Museum, which preaches a 6,000-year-old world, was one way to do it. She's actually doing better now. She has a singing career, of all things, and she goes under the name Nikki Sky. So yay for her, so she's doing better. Um, but it's not better for a lot of students. So let's talk about this. Is it getting better overall? Do you think it's getting better? <laughs> I, th I, think, I think it is getting better. But then the question is like, how? How is it getting better? Who's getting helped by this? What's going on? So 
one thing that's happening, and we're seeing this across the board, every study that comes out basically suggests this. There's a huge demographic shift. So uh, this is a study that actually came out last year. It's the Pew Forum uh, study on millennials. And they talk about how many young people are religiously affiliated. Um, so they ask you if you're Catholic or Christ uh, Protestant or what have you. But this is the percentage of people they asked who were religiously unaffiliated. That doesn't mean you're an atheist. It could mean you're an agnostic. It could mean you're like spiritual but not religious. Like you're a Jesus follower but you don't identify as a Christian, whatever that means. Um, but these are people who are religiously unaffiliated. And you can see these are the people born after uh, 1928. It's pretty low. Even now, it's pretty low. Like, it's 8% or 5%. But then, as you go along the lines, uh, if you were born, if you're a boomer, 1946, 1964, it's a little better. Generation X, a little better. Then you get to the millennials, and this is all of the AHA people for the most part, uh, 81 or later. There's us. 26%. Um, there was a study that just came out yesterday, um, and I can't remember who put it out. But they confirmed this number, totally separate study. It turns out about a quarter of people who are in college now, definitely in high school, are not affiliating with any religion. And that's a good thing. It doesn't mean they're totally on our side, but it means they're willing to say, I'm, I'm not part of that church, I'm not part of that faith group, um, I don't want to be a part of it. And that helps us out because it means there's fewer people who are against us, for one. And it also helps because, and I think this helped the gay movement in a large part, when you know someone who's gay, it's a lot harder to demonize people who are gay. And if you know someone who doesn't subscribe to a particular faith, the same thing goes. It's a lot harder to say, oh, that's the troublemaking atheist, when you happen to know a whole bunch of atheists who are really cool people. Um, there was a book by this Christian uh, researcher named uh, David Kinnaman. He came out with a book that basically talked about why are people leaving the church? Because believe me, Christians have totally noticed that their numbers are dropping. They're not dropping quickly enough for my taste, but they're dropping. And he's wondering, I mean, this is one of the things his organization studied. They said, why are young people leaving the church? And Kinnaman, I really like, because he's very honest about why this is happening, and he goes to Christian groups and he says, you want to know why people aren't coming to church anymore? Let me tell you what, what they have to say. So these were his top six reasons. The church is too insular. Like, they only care about themselves. They don't care about people who are non-Christians. Even if it's true or not, this is what Christians who left the church said. The church cares about itself and nothing else. Um, too irrelevant. They talk about prayer, but they don't care about what's going on in front of them. They talk about, you know, helping people, but look at all. I, I went to a church when I was doing the church visits where one of the things the pastors did is he held up a newspaper in Michigan and he said, this is the front page of our local newspaper. It talks about how the poverty rate in our city is like 20%. And his first question was, what are we as a church doing to address this? Because that was his concern. He's doing what a lot of church pastors don't do, which is try to address a real issue. Um, and a lot of kids are thrown off by that when uh, they don't want to be a part of a church that doesn't care. Obviously, they're too anti-science. We know that. They push all these anti-evolution stuff. They're getting into history books um, and trying to change like how we view history. They're trying to ban English books. We know they're against science for sure, though. Too sex negative. And this falls in line with the anti-gay marriage, all that stuff, and abstinence-only sex education. Too exclusive. It's not good enough that you're a Christian. You have to be an evangelical Christian. What? That person's a Lutheran? Screw them. Like, that's this vibe that a lot of these uh, non-denominational Christians get. Um, and too anti-doubt. What if you're a person who just has questions about some of the things your church teaches you? A lot of people say you've got to suppress the doubt. You just have to have faith. And that's not good enough for a lot of former Christians. They want to leave. None of this stuff, by the way, says that atheists are making them leave church. I just want to point that out. It's not like we're converting every or deconverting everybody. They're just, they're going to church and they're like, this is crazy. And they're leaving. Um, so take that as you will. I just, uh, while we're talking about gay marriage, same sort of demographics with the age groups. Like as you get younger and younger, more people are in favor of same-sex marriage. Religiously unaffiliated is at 66%. But what happens if you just isolate out atheists and agnostics? Then what happens? That number jumps to like 80%, which is still freakishly low, but it just shows there's a huge difference in what's going on. Um, so 
That's one reason things are getting a little better for younger atheists. Just the demographics are in our favor. People are getting sick of what they hear in church, and they're more receptive to listen to at least what people like us have to say. Uh, here's another reason, and we got to thank Christians for this because they helped us out big time. There was a thing in 1984 called the Equal Access Act. The basic idea was a lot of Christians wanted to start high school groups. They already had like Campus Crusade for Christ and groups like that going on college campuses. Now they wanted to move to high school campuses. But basically the school said, no, you can't do it. So they fought. And this is when Reagan was in office. He passed this law that said, if your school allows any sort of extracurriculars, you cannot discriminate on the basis of religion or um, any, uh, basically anything else. You have to allow them to form a group. So for Christians, it was great. They could form like after school Bible studies. They could form groups like that. It also meant you could form groups like the Gay Straight Alliance, which is all over the place now. And for our purpose anyway, it means you could form atheist groups at any high school, public high school in the country. How many of them are there in the country, do you think, atheist groups? In high school? 150? 200. Because, I mean, how many high schools are there in the country, right? 143,000 high schools? So, no, I, I, I'm not doubting that at all. There's, there are like tens at least of thousands of high schools in the country. Surely there are at least a small proportion of atheist groups. Um, so this is, uh, and I'll, I'll show you the actual number in a second. So I work with a group called the Secular Student Alliance. You guys here are an affiliate of the Secular Student Alliance. Um, we, I worked with them for many years. I, when I first got involved in like atheism, that's the group I started working with. I got involved maybe 2004-ish, um, and there were about 50 college groups in the country. That number has changed dramatically um, because if you look at just the college groups, oh, and I'll, I'll get back to this in a second. We actually had a, um, a philanthropist named Todd Stiefel who said, I want to see a lot of high school groups form because to him there weren't enough. He actually gave a, a grant to the SSA to hire someone to just focus on high school groups. And they, they hired JT Eberhard, who focuses on high school groups. But let me show you the numbers. This is the college numbers. It was like 50 way back when, 2005. That number has gone up in colleges, like all over the place. If you look today, there's about, I think, 363 was the last number I saw. This is across the country for all the groups we have who are at least affiliated with us. There may be many groups out there who just aren't affiliated for whatever reason, but you can see that number is increasing by a lot, and that is awesome. Now, how many of those are high school groups? Because that's included in this number. So, high school groups, this is where we're at. Yeah, um, 2007, we're like two. Um, spring of 2011, this is a year ago. We're talking 13 or so. 13, 120 would be great, <laughs> like 13 high school groups across the country. I don't have the numbers for fall of 2011, but I do have the number for now. And this is what's happened after Todd gave that grant to hire an SSA focused on high school campus organizer. Here's the number now. Yeah, that is awesome. So now we're at like 45, 46 groups. But, I mean, why is that number still so low for as many high school groups as there are? Why is that number so low? That's, we're not even talking one per state. So what's going on here? I mean, I'd love to hear responses. Why do you think that number is low? Kids don't know it's an option. Sure, I think that's a huge thing. Kids don't know that they can form a group. Yeah. They're worried about being judged for their religious belief. Absolutely. If you want to start an atheist group, you're basically painting a target on yourself. And man, is there anything harder for a high schooler for any, you know, you want to stay out of the spotlight at all costs in high school much less paint a giant target, yeah. You have to find a teacher that will sponsor Yeah, you have to find a faculty sponsor. Now, there is a law that says if, you, if no teacher will sponsor your group, the school still has to provide you some way to host your group. But you're right, it would be so much easier if there was a teacher out there who said, you know what, uh, I'm an atheist, I'll support your group. Or better yet, I mean, and I'll take this, I don't, I don't care if you know what my religious beliefs are, I will still sponsor your group. Yeah, it'd be nice if the kids knew there was someone out there who could help them out if that was the case. Any other reasons? Yeah. Some of the high schools are just simply too small. There's not enough people who self-identify as atheists. Yeah, maybe you are the only atheist in your town or something like that. That happens. 
Sure. So I mean, all of these contribute to this factor. So this is this is one of the things we have to address. We have such a potential to grow these high school groups, but yeah, for all these reasons, kids don't even know that's an option. And I mean, I can tell you, I became an atheist from a religious background when I was starting my freshman year, and I didn't know anyone else who was an atheist. I didn't know I could form an atheist group. I didn't know atheist groups were a thing, <laughs> like, and I didn't figure that out till like college. Um, and even then, I needed some help. So here's another thing, though, and this is what's really exciting. The media loves good stories. Good stories have conflicts. Every time a young atheist does anything, there is conflict. So every time there's a story about a young atheist doing anything, the media flocks to it. And now that we have this proliferation of like Facebook and blogs and any type of social media, whenever we hear about these stories, we spread the word really quickly. So I want to show you a few of these stories that are just amazing. Um, this is a high school group in uh, Florida, and the fact that they exist, they didn't do anything controversial. They didn't like get a lot of controversy in forming. They have a faculty sponsor who's very supportive. That is it. The story is that they exist. And that's in the New York Times. And they quote a lot of these students, they quote a lot of faculty sponsors, but the one that really gets to you, the one that really makes you like, like pay attention to the story, it's toward the end of the article. <clears throat> and this is what a student said, there are students who do not want their parents to know they belong to an atheist club. I tell my mother I'm an ocean club. <laughs> what is ocean club? I don't even know, but it sounds better than atheist club. Um, and this one, another member said her father, blah, 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 he, I wouldn't want to fight with him. She asked that her name not be used for fear. It would hurt her father. I don't want us to grow apart over this. How sad is that? Um, but I get it. I get that when you're in high school and you're under your parents' roof, like, it's very hard to say uh, you're anything in the minority of any sort that they're not happy with. Um, I didn't come out to my parents as an atheist when I was in high school. I reluctantly did it in college. And now they, they have no choice but to accept it. But like I didn't tell them in high school. Um, and I can totally understand. That's why. But here's the nice part. When this story goes on the New York Times website and people can start to spread it, you realize if you're one of those, I don't know, half a percent of high schoolers who reads the New York Times, there are students out there. There are students out there who feel the same way. And look, they started a group. And look at how amazing it is. Because the rest of the article talks about what this group has done for those atheists who attend that school. And it's awesome. And they talk like in glowing terms about how great it is for them. Um, here's another story. This is um, the Southern Poverty Law Center. They're the group that always designates hate groups around the country. Um, they actually put out a magazine called Tolerance. And they send it to public schools. So, I'll be, I teach at a really huge public school in the suburbs of Chicago. I saw this lying in my like t math office teacher lounge. Like this, this magazine called Tolerance. And one of the articles they had, they only come out four times a year, and a couple issues ago they had a whole section about the unaffiliated, the people who don't belong to a faith. And so they highlight a lot of these students who are going through crap at their school. Students like Nicole who are kicked out for things that they believe, who get ostracized for it. Um, and one of the cool things they talk about, and one of the best parts about this article, they actually had a guide for teachers on how to deal with students who don't belong to a faith. And they actually said, have them read this article and then discuss it. And here are some questions to toss out there. When does ostracism or social pressure to conform cross the line into bullying? Is there a line? How do we stop? The, think of the discussion you could get going with that question. Um, is negative peer pressure ever acceptable? Why or why not? What happens when religious students are you know, trying to be your friend, but really they just want you to come to church? Is that bullying? I don't know, but it would spur a really interesting conversation. Um, but this is what they were offering to teachers. I thought that was pretty neat. Um, this is a cool story. This was in USA Today, because this student, Brian Lisko in Houston, wanted to start a group. Um, and every time he tried to fill out the paperwork at his public high school, basically he kept getting shut down. Um, three months, one hurdle after another. At one point, the principal said he could have the club, just call it a philosophy club. <laughs> and don't affiliate with the Secular Students Alliance. Because, you know, when the Fellowship of Christian Athletes wants to form, they're like, just call yourselves sports people who sometimes go to church. I don't know. Um, that never happens. But what do we do? 
we find out about this story, we alert the media, and we say, look, here is a young child who is being ostracized for his non-belief. And that's what we did. That Secular Student Alliance contacted USA Today and said, here's a story for you. And what did USA Today do? Five days worth of emails like, hi, we're USA Today. Why are you not letting this group form? Hi, we're USA Today. Why are you not letting this group form? <laughs> On day five, they get a response back from the school. He can have his group. <laughs> and that's it. So after a request for comment, the school abruptly granted him the Secular Student Alliance Club on Tuesday. Like there's no reason that they can stop this group from forming and they can't make you call it something else either. Now, how that plays socially, like maybe your friends do ostracize you because you start an atheist group. That's not what I'm talking about. This is just legally speaking, the school has to let you do it. Um, this one happened fairly recently. This girl, Crystal Myers in uh, Lenore, Tennessee. I used to live in Knoxville, Tennessee for like two years. This is not far from there, but heavy Bible Belt area. All she did is, for her high school newspaper, she wrote an article about the life of an atheist. Basically saying that there's a, uh, why, do athe why does atheism have such a bad reputation? Why do we not have the same rights as Christians? And what did her school do? They wouldn't let her publish her editorial in the school newspaper. So what do you do? You tell the press. And then you say, hey look, the school won't let this child print an article, it's about atheism. So the Knoxville News Sentinel, the biggest newspaper in that area, picked up on that. Not only did they tell her story and try to get sound bites from the faculty like, I mean, you come up with a good reason for not letting this student run this paper. Because if you read the article, it's not a bad article. Um, and you know, they make up some weird excuses. And then the Knoxville News Sentinel went one step further. They just said, oh, we'll publish your article for you in our paper. And so they did. Hey, how cool is that? Maybe your high school newspaper, again, read by what? 1% of the student body? And now you've got thousands of people reading it and it's online so even more people can read it. Um, awesome. And um, I'll go back to that in a second. Here's, but this is the huge thing. Again, media loves conflict. Atheists, by definition almost, are conflict. Um, so anytime there's a story, all you gotta do, I mean, believe me, the media is paying attention, but people don't even realize that all you gotta do, you know, if you have a TV station, TV news station, they have a place on their website where you can send them story tips. Do it. If you know any, if you follow any columnists in a local paper or their newspaper um, has a website, they are looking for stories and they're looking for interesting stories, especially ones no one else is covering because they don't want to rehash the same articles you can get anywhere else. So if there's a local paper, tell them about what's going on and they will do something about it. Um, this happened, uh, if any of you watch Glee, they actually had a character come out as an atheist and the conversation was so cool because you never would have heard this type of dialogue um, a few years ago. And I apologize for the watermark, I kind of had to swipe this online, but um, let me play this for you because it's a really neat clip. And you don't need to know about the show to understand what's going on. Thank you, Mercedes. Your voice is stunning, but I don't believe in God. Wait, what? You go for festivals and you don't stay in line. I think God is kind of like Santa Claus for adults. Otherwise, God's kind of a jerk, isn't he? He makes me gay and has his followers going around telling me it's something that I chose, as if someone would choose to be mocked every single day of their life. And right now, I don't want to have any father. I don't ever want that. But Kurt, how do you know for sure? I mean, you can't prove that there's no God. If you can't prove that there isn't a magic teapot floating around on the dark side of the moon with a dwarf inside of it that reads romance novels and shoots lightning out of its boobs, but <laughs> it's not a prison. Is God an evil dwarf? We shouldn't be talking about this. It's not right. I'm sorry, Paul. But you all can believe whatever you want to. I can't believe something I don't. I appreciate your thoughts. But I don't want the prayers. Cool. When was that seen on TV ever before? But that's unlike one of the hottest shows on TV. That's really neat. And they don't like disparage him for saying those things. Like he's ostracized enough as he is on the show. But um, it's really cool that they could have that dialogue in there. So here's another thing that we've been doing to help young atheists in general. We started supporting them. And like, we, like I said, we didn't have a, a structure in place to do this when Nicole went through her stuff several years ago, but we do now. Um, and this is something like I think is so important that I know I'm putting a lot of my weight into this. I'm trying to do what I can to help the cause, but 
I heard about a story about this kid. His name is Damon Fowler. In Louisiana, his high school had graduation prayers. So he tried to put a stop to it. He told the administration, you're not allowed to do this, put a stop to it. And basically, he, when they didn't do anything about it, he went to like the local ACLU. And they did try to do something about it. They sent letters to the school. Damon, as you might expect in a very religious area, got ostracized for it. His parents actually kicked him out of his house. Yeah, so what are you supposed to do when you're like barely 18? I don't even know if he was 18 at the time, and your parents don't want, even want you to live with them. He had to uh, move with his, live with his brother who lives in another state. But when the media found out about it, <clears throat> they started, <clears throat> excuse me, they started writing about this story. And like any time they do any story about this sort of thing, they talk to the faculty, they talk to the administration. And the reason I really got invested in this story is I read these quotations. Misty Quinn has been on the staff at the high school for almost 25 years. And what's even more sad is this is a student who hasn't really contributed anything to graduation or to their classmates. She's a teacher and she's bashing a student in print in the media. Like, I've been teaching for five years. There are plenty of students I'm not a fan of. <laughs> but I would never trash them in, like, on my website to a bunch of people. Like, no, you don't do that. Who does that? What does a student have to do to get a teacher to talk smack about him in the media? He points out that you're doing something illegal. Like, that's all he did. So um, I started um, a little fundraiser on my website saying, OK, can people just chip in money? At least you know, if this kid's graduating, maybe we can at least get him a college scholarship. And they did. And a lot of people helped out with that. But we raised over $31,000 for this kid. I think that, that's an awesome number. Just look, check out that 1,200 contributors um, through that chip in widget. So many people wanted to help out. And they helped out in like, $5 increments, $10 increments, all over the place. Um, and that money is helping uh, pay for like tuition and his moving costs in some sense. He's still living with his brother. But tuition, dorms, he's actually starting community college, um, I believe, this coming fall. So it took a year for him to kind of get back on his feet, but he's doing really well. Um, and like you mentioned earlier, Jessica Alquist did the exact same type of thing. She said, there's a banner hanging in my high school auditorium that is basically an homage to God. That shouldn't be there. Let's take it down. The school wouldn't listen. She took it to the ACLU. They said, you're right. That needs to be taken down. And that case, basically, for, and by the way, a lot of people found out about her story earlier this year because the judge ruled that, yeah, this thing is illegal. The school has to take it down. But this case was going on for almost a year before then. From the second they filed the lawsuit to the time a judge heard it and they went through the whole case. Like, and she was getting crap all over the place for this. Like, she lost how many friends? Who knows? She had teachers talking smack about her to her face. The mayor of their town came to the school, gave a presentation, and at one point they said, hey, mayor, what do you think about that prayer banner? Oh, I think it should stay up there because it's great. Basically, while she was in the room, like knowing that she was in the room. So she had to go through plenty of stuff. And when this happened, um, and you guys mentioned this earlier too, a lot of people wanted to figure out how can we help Jessica because she deserves to be helped. They made these shirts. The state senator in Rhode Island, where she's from, said she's a troublemaker. They said she was an evil little thing. A state senator said that about a 16-year-old girl who was pointing out that the school was doing something illegal. So the people said, all right, well, we're just going to make t-shirts that say evil little thing and sell them. And the money's going to go to her scholarship fund. And it did. And it, they eventually raised about $8,000. That all fed into another fundraiser we had on my site, which a bunch of people linked to, raised 48000 there. I got an email from a guy who said, I just want to help out. I don't want to go through that website. Um, can I just give $5,000 somehow? Yes. Let me, tell you, <laughs> let me tell you where you can send it. So overall, we raised $68,000 through various contributions. And I had the honor of giving her this huge check at the Reason Rally a few weeks ago. So, Really awesome, she's starting, she's actually not starting college for a while, she's a senior next year. But I don't even know if she knows if she wants to attend the school next year. I mean, it's been bad enough this year and it's not gonna get any easier for her because to everyone else, she's like this evil little atheist girl. I don't know if she's gonna go back to that school or graduate early or whatever. But here's the cool thing, even though Damon, even though Jessica went through all this stuff, 
Our community, however you want to define that, we were there for them in some way. When Jessica had school board meetings where they, the school board was deciding, should we appeal the judge's ruling and fight to keep the banner up, or should we just let it go, pay the attorney's fees, and just move on? There were so many Christians in that crowd yelling, and I'm going to show you an image of that in a second, but um, for all that, there were so many atheists who drove in to where that school board meeting was held just to voice their support for her. Um, at least in Jessica's case, her parents were very supportive of what she was doing. That doesn't always happen. But we were there for her, and that helps. Um, and I want to show a clip of something that happened after this ruling came down. She was interviewed on CNN. And it's just, I, I want to show it because it just shows how articulate she is and how well, like, what she had to go through and how strong she is in spite of all that. We were just showing some pictures of uh, angry parents who were um, uh, you know, very loudly talking about the Pledge of Allegiance and saying the Pledge of Allegiance in this meeting that clearly became very uh, you know, full of anger. What do you make of the like, hostility that's come out around this? You've gotten death threats, is that correct? That's correct. And um, it's been really difficult, obviously, just to um, constantly have this feeling of hatred towards me in my community. Um, the meeting itself was difficult, but it, it's kind of what's been going on for a long time now. And, um, you know, I, I'm, I think I'm ready for it at this point. Um, but you never really get used to hearing about how bad you are, really. Um, it, it, it always hurts. And the death threats obviously have always hurt my feelings. Um, I've just kind of gotten to the point where I can cope with it. It's not so much that I'm, you know, okay with it happening, but I'm able to cope with it. There's a congressperson, a uh, state rep, who, um, Peter Palumbo, and he said this about me. He said, you are an evil little fit, and you've had to have a police escort take you to school. Have you responded to him? Um, I haven't responded to him directly, but the response so far to that comment has, it's almost a bit of a mockery. Um, I feel it's immature and inappropriate for a state representative, who represents me also, by the way, um, to be calling me something as petty as an evil little thing. And so while it does kind of hurt a bit, um, we've kind of turned it into a, a joke. I've heard about and that. I've got a friend who's uh, <laughs> now co-opted the phrase, I hope you trademark that, evil little thing, right? <laughs> T-shirts that he's selling so that you can help fund your college education. Is that right? That is right. Um, there's a website where people are purchasing the t-shirts, and um, I've seen lots of people um, at the meeting for them, and um, people take pictures of themselves wearing them and post them to Facebook so I can see, and, and I think it's really cute, and in a lot of ways, I think his little comment has kind of backfired, because now we're using it as a positive thing. You know, it's, it's almost a way of saying that people stand with me. Just so. So, yay! That's hap I mean, compare that to that video of Nicole at the beginning when it was like her and her dad, and that's it. Um, okay, so after all this, what can we do now? And this is where I'm asking for your help for stuff. This is the number we've seen. This is for the high school groups. There's no reason with as many tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of high schools as there are in this country that this number should be as low as it is. So for any of the college students who are here, I'm sure you either still have ties to your high school or that you have friends or siblings who are still in high school. You, can, you have the ability to convince people to start a group at that school. If you know anyone who's an atheist who's young, get them to start the thing. Find out what it takes to get an organized group started at that school. Find out what, every school is different. This is what makes it hard to organize high schools compared to colleges. Colleges are relatively the same. You go to your student organization's representative, you fill out the paperwork, you need a And this is a really hard thing to do. I mean, it's hard enough to get college students to come out of the closet. And if you guys have been to discussions, uh, maybe you've met people who say like, okay, I'm coming to this meeting, but my own friends don't know I'm coming to this meeting right now. And my family certainly doesn't know I'm coming to this meeting right now. It's hard enough when you're in college trying to come out. If you're in high school, when, like I said, when you're under your parents' roof, you definitely can't because you don't know what's going to happen. Are your parents going to kick you out? Are they going to shun you? Um, maybe you just want to keep quiet about it. But in a lot of cases, uh, the students don't necessarily have to come out to be a part of that club. And the school has no obligation, and again, this is depending on the school, the school has no obligation to tell your parents you are part of an atheist club. 
So, I mean, it's nice if they know friends who are not religious, who might be able to come to these groups and discuss these things that are so hard to discuss when you don't have a proper venue for them. <clears throat> uh, here's another thing. This is an organization I started working with a few years ago. Um, I'll tell you the quick backstory, which is that all these studies started coming out saying, who's more charitable, uh, religious people or non-religious people? Um, at least among other things they asked. And every study showed religious people are far more generous than non-religious people are. Which kind of rings a bell, because it's like, wait, we're not less generous, but like, you go to church and you can give a tithe. You go to a church, they have collections for uh, an earthquake that happens or a disaster that happens. We don't have that sort of network. We don't have a way to give, even though we'd be happy to text a number and give 10 bucks, or you know, we might by ourselves go to a website and give money. We don't have a network to do it. So a friend of mine, Dale McGowan, started this group called Foundation Beyond Belief. I'm on the board of it now. But basically the idea is, let us pick five charities every few months, every quarter. We'll pick five charities. Maybe one of them tackles education issues. One of them tackles uh, women's rights. One of them tackles environmental issues. Um, and we will point them out. These are all secular groups. They're not atheist charities. They're not religious charities. They are secular charities. And we will vet them for you. We will uh, avow that they are good charities using the money in a wise way. And you can decide how much money goes to each category. Maybe you really like education groups, so you want to give like 30% of your monthly contribution goes there. Uh, you don't really care for the environment. 10% of your money goes there. But over the course of two years, we started this at the beginning of 2010, uh, we raised over a quarter million dollars for charities across the world. And this is all atheist money. This is all atheist giving as a group of atheists. One of the, the reason I bring this up, one of the things we're going to do this summer is we're going to find a way to really address young atheists, high school atheists, maybe even younger. We want to find a way for these students who probably don't have money of their own, or I, I didn't when I was a, growing up, or maybe they have an allowance, maybe they have a little bit of money that they can do something with. We want to find a way to get them interested so that giving to charity for them just becomes a habit. So we're going to focus on that this summer, and hopefully we'll be able to announce that soon. This is another thing that uh, JT at the Secular Student Alliance is starting soon, too. Um, so on Friday, we had the Day of Silence, right? Um, any of you know, did any of you participate in that in high school? Day of Silence? OK. So Day of Silence is a day uh, when it's a student-run initiative, where basically you could wear a sticker that says, I am going to be silent all day. Um, on behalf of all the gay students who have had to be silent about their identity. Um, and you know, you go to class, if you've got to give a presentation, you give a presentation. But for the most part, you're walking down the hallway, you're silent. If anyone asks you why you're silent, they know, because it says on your sticker. Um, obviously, I'm a teacher, I'm not going to participate in that. But I was more than happy to wear that sticker that says I support any gay student at the school. Like, I'm, if I see any bullying, I'm going to put a stop to it. That's not asking me to do a lot. But it seems like, hey, if there are any gay students in my class, hopefully they'll see that and realize this is a safe place for them in my classroom. This is what we're trying to do for atheist students, too. So this is a program they're going to start in the fall called the Secular Safe Zone. Basically, we're going to give high schools this material that says, look, there are people at your high school who are not religious. In a lot of places in this country, that's not a safe thing to be. You can't be an atheist because all this stuff's going to happen to you. Look at all these stories. So if you could put the sign in your classroom, it lets students who are not religious know this is an OK place for them to talk about their views, if it's appropriate. And this is a teacher who's not going to harass them or do anything because they're not religious. Um, there's more to it than that, but that's the beginning of a program that's going to start this fall. Um, you can debate how effective that's going to be. Uh, I think anything's a positive sign. And this, as this grows, this program is going to do a lot more stuff. Um, and I do want to tell you one thing. I, I, like I said, I'm a teacher. I can't start these groups. But earlier this year, uh, I did have three students come up to me. They find out I'm an atheist. I don't know how. But they find out. And they said, we want to start an atheist group at the school. We want to know, would you be a sponsor for it? Sure, I'll be a sponsor. I mean, I'll do that. That's not asking. I mean, I'm going to stay 10 feet away from this because I don't want to be seen as me doing this for you. But if you need any help, I'll be happy to help you. But in the back of my head, I'm thinking, what do college students, I mean, what do high school students want to do with an atheist group? And I braced myself for the worst. Because I'm like, what are they going to do? Are they just going to like mock Christians? Like, because if you're in high school, how nuanced are your views going to be? It's probably going to be us versus them. 
And um, I'm like, what are you going to do? Like, make fun of them? Are you just going to like get in a little circle and like talk about all the evil things religion has done? I'm um, thinking that's probably what high schoolers are going to do. I totally underestimated my own kids because when I asked them, so what do you want to do with this group? They were like, we want to do a lot of community service because we figure atheists should do that. We want to have discussions about like with other religions about you know what how we figure out what's right and what's wrong. Um, we definitely want to like decrease the stigma of atheists in our community. Holy crap! Like that's awesome. I'm just like smiling, nodding. Uh huh. Um, now these are juniors in high school. They have a lot of stuff going on. That group never got off the ground. But the fact that there are students at all who think that way boggles my mind. And the fact that if it happened at my school, which is in a pretty religious area, it probably happens in a lot of areas too. So whatever we can do to support those students, anything we can do to help them start these groups, you guys have seen what happens at a college group when it has this network. We have a lot of students who now go to college wondering if there's a secular student alliance group for them. And if there isn't, they can easily start one. We want that to happen at the high school level too, and there's no reason it can't. Um, so, I think that's all I had to say. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Um, and if you ever have anything happen, if you know of anything happening and you want to get publicity for it, I'd be happy to help any way I can. Um, but yeah, please uh, feel free to contact me and thank you so much for bringing me out here. Can I answer any questions? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. I mean, the first thing is if you have any students contact you, try to get their contact information. Don't give them the SSA's email address. You get their email address because, and you could send it to the SSA. That's a much easier way of making it happen. Let the SSA contact them. Otherwise, it's kind of creepy. But yeah, um, that's one thing to do. The other thing is, look, you know people in your community who are receptive to these ideas. You know people who have children who go to these schools. Um, and I've seen it start. I haven't really seen it really burst. But I know one kid who started a group at his junior high. Um, yeah, boggles my mind because I was not thinking about this stuff in junior high. But he started it there. I mean, and you have, I've met other students who maybe not, haven't started a group, but they know they're atheists. And again, we could discuss if this is a good or bad thing. They know they're atheists when they're like eight years old. Um, but when they're that young, they could still get some sort of discussion going on these topics. So if you know people who have these kids or they have relatives who are that age, um, talk to them and see what they can do to talk to those parents to see if those kids can get involved in their schools in some way. And even if you don't start an atheist group, all of these students probably have some way of getting this discussion started. Um, maybe they want to have a discussion about um, philosophy. Maybe they want to have a discussion about what are the differences between various religions. I mean, I would imagine a lot of schools are very receptive to that idea because it's an educational thing. That's not a us versus them. That's not a let's push atheism on people. That's just a let's, let's discuss these differences because a lot of times in class you don't have that opportunity. So um, that's, that's definitely uh, one way to do it. Um, I don't, I, one of the things that I think is better nowadays, when I was in high school and I became an atheist, there wasn't anyone to talk to because I didn't know anyone who was an atheist. But I would go online. They were talking like late night AOL dial up internet. Like there weren't even websites about this stuff except like the ones that were written in like Comic Sans and Crazy Font. Um, they were like, that stuff wasn't there. Now I would imagine if you're in high school, there are books in the library about this stuff. There are websites all over the place about this stuff. I would imagine it's easier to be an atheist in the sense that. There's other people out there, and it's easy to find those people, even if they're not by you. So by all means, direct those students to, to different resources on the internet, because I'm, I'm sure you know a bunch of them. Direct them to those places if they have any questions or want to know. Thank you for sending them to the SSA website. Yes? Sure. To be prepared for next year. And we're a brand new committee. We haven't really gotten too involved in this yet, but we do know that we want to do a scholarship 
we were talking about maybe having some kind of a, an essay, but you're actually making me think that perhaps maybe the, the criteria could be that they start club. Yeah, that's actually something I'm working on too. Um, it's not anywhere close to being finalized yet, but we'll see how much we can expand that. That's not a bad way to do it. Um, now, and usually, I would imagine high schools, if you tell them, look, we're just, we're a group, a non, uh, I think your Atheist United is a 501c3, we want to start a scholarship fund, maybe you, have, maybe you say we have a thousand dollar scholarship we want to give to high school students, here is the information about it and the requirements, can you please have this in your list of scholarships, because usually a lot of these high schools have a place where they just say, look, high schoolers, here's all the scholarships you can apply for, and uh, you want yours in the mix. Yeah. So we have to think about what, what, we want the what the criteria are. Get the yeah. I think locally, I think starting a group at your school is the best way to do it. Now, you want to be careful that it's a group that's been in existence for a while. You don't want a student to just say, I started a group, it formed last week, now give me some money. <laughs> so maybe say, you know, you have to have had a group for a year or something like that. Now that's hard for a senior who's applying for a scholarship now, but maybe, again, this is something to discuss. This is one of those things to talk about. Um, American Atheist does a thing where they're like, uh, we don't even care if you write an essay or not. Just show us how you've been an activist somehow. We don't care if you send us pictures, you send us a link to a website you set up or whatever. Um, just show us that you've been some sort of activist and we'll, we'll judge it based on its own merits. Because some students hate writing essays, they're not good writers, that's fine. Um, that's another way to do it. So all of those things are awesome. If you do it, please let me know, because I'd love to hear about it. Cool. Yeah, yes? Do you know if there's a single one of these clubs in Texas? You know, off the top of my head, I don't. I, I can tell you that, at least when it comes to college groups, the Secular Student Alliance has a wonderful track record in really hardcore religious places. We could not get a group started in like Rhode Island, New York, Oregon for the longest time, because who needs them there? But in the Bible Belt states, oh man, they are flourishing. I would guess there's a high school group somewhere. Brian Lisko is the one from USA Today is in Houston. So that one exists. Um, but I don't know how many more there are. I'm sure there are, I would put more money on there being a groups, group or groups in Texas than in most other states though, because you need one there. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you kind of keep a low profile in your high school about this. Yeah. Have you gotten any kind of like criticism or backlash from the administration or from students regarding your lack of faith? Sure. Um. So a couple. So this is my fifth year teaching at the same school. It's the only teaching position I've had. But um, a couple years ago, because of stuff I wrote on my website, calling out some family Christian group in locally. They basically wrote a letter to my math department chair and my whole administration and the entire school board saying, look at what this atheist writes on his website. Like, and to their credit, one of the school board members who has never met me, I don't know why they would ever meet me, he basically wrote back, uh, who cares, he doesn't do this in school. <laughs> like, wow, that is awesome. I'm gonna stay the heck out of this conversation. Um, but like, and you know, I, I did talk to my principal about this. We had a meeting about this. Only, if nothing else, what if this group gains traction? And like they have, because they're, they weren't calling for me to get fired, because they know I didn't do this in class. They were calling for parents to pull their children out of my classes. And the, so the principal and my boss was like, so what happens if anyone takes these people seriously? And he said, we should at least come up with a game plan in case this goes viral somewhere. Um, and the basic conversation was, what, so my boss said, what if a parent calls me and says I want my child out of his classroom? Principal, who is religious by the way, is like, uh, you'd ask them, do you have a problem with what he's doing in the classroom? No. Okay, then this conversation's over. And that's it, hang up the phone. So that was great. So they were very good about that. That's the only time there's been anything, thankfully that thing didn't go anywhere. Because um, it's not like I'm walking into class saying like, this is, like, this is I. It's an imaginary number, kind of like God. Like, I'm not. <laughs> Plus, it's not even like, it's, it's not even science class where this stuff would even be a concern. So it hasn't come up. But like, they've seen me in the classroom. They know I focus on math. And my kids, I mean, the kids know I don't talk about the website. 
they all know like I do other stuff outside of school. They know I travel a lot on weekends, but I don't talk about it. So, I mean, the only, besides that one incident, the only time it's even come up, some, like if I have a parent-teacher conference, we'll talk about the parents, like their kid. Here's what your kids do in class. Okay, conversation, conversation, they'll leave. They're like, oh, by the way, we like your website. Okay, no comment, thank you. <laughs> like, still avoiding that one. So I mean, I, I go out of my way to make sure it doesn't come up in class. If the kids ask me about it in class, because that's happened too, I usually just shut down the conversation or say like, ask me after school or whatever. But uh, it, it hasn't been a bad thing, but I think part of that is because I don't make it a thing. Kind of a follow up to that. Yeah. Uh, is there a, like a form or a place at your high school to kind of give a presentation like you're giving here today? Do you have a, oh, I don't know if you're allowed to do this, but. Sure, I mean, it, is there a form, I guess, you know, one time the, there is an Indian Student Association at my school, and they did say, can you talk about your book? And I did, I gave a presentation about my book that was very, it wasn't like, yay atheism, it was more like, here's what happened, here's, a, here's how the book came about, um, and that wasn't offensive to like anybody. Um, I gave that, that was a forum for it, but otherwise, I mean, uh, unless a group after school like invited me to give a talk specifically about this or something like that, probably not. Um, but not because it can't happen, just because that forum, that club isn't out there or something. Other? Yes? You were saying that um, as a teacher, you shouldn't uh, start a, or encourage a club at your school. Yeah. Is that something you would encourage in your school? Now, is that, is that something that's particular to teachers or uh, uh, non-teaching staff? Let me, let me rephrase that. that I, I think I have to double check on this. I don't know if it's a law or if it's just a lot of schools' policies that teachers cannot initiate any groups. It has to be student-led. Just like. Um, the basketball prayer that you saw in that earlier video, the reason that was allowed to go on at all is because supposedly it was student-led. The same reason the, the day of silence thing in favor of gay lesbian students happens, that's all student-led. That's allowed to happen. And the schools can't put a stop to that unless it's disruptive to class. Um, so I, all I'm saying is, depending on the school's rules, you don't want to be known as the teacher who like urged a student to start a group because, I mean, how many ways can you misconstrue that and s blow that up into a, this teacher said he was going to fail the student if the student didn't start this group. I mean, I don't know what could happen. But uh, if there is a student who you know is atheist, I mean, I don't think it's a big deal to say like, oh, if you ever wanted to start a group, I'd be there for you or something like that. I don't think that would be out of line. Yeah. Regional body, and I work for them, so you know, it's a little bit different. Um, but uh, I would be more or less, you know, working possibly with the district, somebody who I don't actually work for in the first place. Yeah. Um. Again, I, I think if you know anyone personally, it's probably a lot easier. I don't know how you would even be able to talk to any students to talk about this sort of stuff if you're working at a district level. Well, yeah, sure. I mean, so if your daughter wanted to start a group, great. If your uh, daughter knew anyone who wanted to start a group, that'd be fine too. Um, and I don't know how it would work where if they needed any <coughs> faculty sponsors or anything, I don't know what the limitations are for that. But yeah, I mean, that's, that's your in if you ever wanted to get a group started. And I, I really, I want to uh, preface it. I don't think I'm saying anything out of the ordinary. I don't think I'm saying anything that I would be like embarrassed if a Christian heard it. I'm not asking anyone to do anything like to push atheism. I think these atheists are already out there. I'm just saying, let's form a group if you are. That's not a bad thing. Is there, How yes. Pay? For. Well, like you said, you live in Chicago and you're here. Yeah, usually the groups that bring me out, there are a lot of colleges have ways of getting money for speakers. If you are a registered student group, your campus usually has money to bring you out here. That's usually how I get places. Yeah. Uh huh? Uh, this is actually more. Yeah. <laughs> Just to give you a, a sense of how much things have improved. Uh, I went to college in the late 80s in rural Missouri, and I started a non-religious group for the first time ever in, okay. in, in campus history. We had a sort of caucus with the Wiccans and the uh, Pagans. <laughs> <laughs> and it was called the Forum for Alternative Religions. And uh, you know, I put up posters. I, there was absolutely no support from any national network. This is pre-internet. 
the only thing I had to go on was the Freedom from Religion Foundation newsletter. Yeah. And um, we started holding meetings, and about half the people who showed up were instigators from Campus Crusade for Christ and Student Center, uh, Baptist Student Union, and so on. And it basically devolved into shouting matches week after week after week, and within a few months it was gone. The group was gone. Yeah, the group was totally gone. That's. Um, I found out a few years ago that it's been reborn. Um, the same group or a different name? The same name. Wow. It is, it is now it is not going, and um, it was very hard to turn. That's awesome. Um, you know, when uh, I had a group in college, and we actually had a couple Christians who said they were Christians, they came to our weekly discussions, and one, I think the second week they were there, were just like, oh, you're back. Like, why are you here? And they actually said this. They said, we go to a Christian college in the city. We just thought the discussion here was really interesting last week, and we get nothing like it at our own campus. <laughs> that was it. They didn't agree with anything we were saying, but they wanted to have that discussion. They weren't instigators. They just wanted to take part. And it was nice, because the last thing you want is a bunch of people who just nod their heads at everything you say. So it was good. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of stories about people who, like the second they put up posters, they're ripped down. Like how, there's so many, and this is what we tell all of our college groups. If you are putting up posters of any sort, any signs of any sort, take a picture the second it goes up, and if it gets vandalized or anything, is graffiti's drawn on it, if it gets ripped down, take an after picture because we can use that. Um, hopefully it won't happen, but, and you know, some groups have even put up signs that said, um, God is watching, are you really gonna vandalize this? And <laughs> stuff like that. And then atheist group meets at this time, this place, whatever. Um, just because it's fun. Um, but yeah, a lot of these groups are starting. In fact, a lot of the groups have even reached out to the religious groups on campus trying uh, on purpose, let's do this joint event. Let's not just a debate, but let's have a discussion on does God exist. But we want to do it in conjunction with a religious group on campus because it's more interesting that way. I went to a... Um, a debate on intelligent design versus evolution. It was co-sponsored with like the Hindu Student Council on campus. Like, what do they have in this match? Who cares? It's another religious group. Bring them in. That's awesome. Get a discussion going with more people. So it's that's great to hear that they got it going back up. Did you have anything to do with them getting it back up? Cool. That's great. Any other questions? Yes. Um, have you heard of any atheist, or I guess not the appropriate version of theism groups? Um, Spawning at private religious high schools? Uh, religious high schools? Yes. No, not yet. Several uh, that have started at religious colleges. Um, the only, I mean, and like I, my grad school, I did at DePaul in Chicago, which is affiliated with the Catholic Church. They have a huge atheist group there. Like, <clears throat> excuse me, a lot of those schools are great about allowing groups to form. They don't necessarily support what they do, but they're all for the freedom of discussion, which is great. Um, there is an underground student group at Brigham Young. Like, they're not allowed to form and they would be kicked out. But there is a group that meets, like, secretly there that they don't have, they have, like, a closed Facebook group and you gotta be let in privately, whatever. But um, I have not heard of any group at a religious high school. I have heard a couple stories of, like, uh, I think this happened recently at a Catholic school. They brought in a speaker to talk about marriage. And at some point, they started talking about how gay marriage was wrong and same-sex adoption was evil. And the kids basically revolted. And that is awesome. And that has nothing to do with any group. That's just kids realizing this is all BS and we're just gonna put it, like we're walking out of here. Some kids left crying, but then they told their parents why they were crying and their parents were like, why would you do this? And the Catholic school's like, we're a Catholic school. What did you <laughs> expect? But I mean, a lot of these kids are really good about it. So, um, but I haven't heard of anything like an atheist group trying to form there that, I mean, they, they, sh they wouldn't be allowed to form um, unless they put it under a different name and that's what happens at a private school. Yes? I'm curious about your thoughts about sort of the direction of the atheist movement in general, not, not just at the college or high school. Sure. Um, obviously at the college or high school, they'll be talking more about supporting those people that already identify and come out maybe close to that point. Yeah. I mean, 
I don't know if we have to do anything. I think it's already happening. I think you're going to start seeing more celebrities just point out that they're not religious. Not even as, I'm an atheist like Bill Maher does, but more of a Ricky Gervais, like look at how silly religion is, that sort of thing. That's just starting to happen. I mean, the fact you have like Daniel Radcliffe, Harry Potter coming out and saying, oh yeah, I'm not religious. Like that's going to happen a lot more. Um, you're going to start seeing, I would hope, more non-religious people running for public office and hopefully winning at some point. I mean, we know Pete Stark is the only one who's in office right now who's openly non-religious, but you have like at least two people with legitimate shots at Congress who are running for Congress right now who are not religious. One's bisexual too. Like, cool. When does that happen? So that's going to start happening. What's going to happen, I think, is yes, you're still going to see places where oppression happens and discrimination happens, but you're going to start seeing it almost become mainstream. Like, and that's going to be a weird moment when this is not like the minority group or like the out group in some way. So I think it's starting to happen and I think as more people start, uh, like the religious right are doing more to push people away from their side than we are to bring them in. I think what we need to do is, I, I don't know if this has happened with Atheists United at all, I know when I started getting involved in this movement, there were a lot of college groups, though like, what was it, like 50 compared to like 360 now. There were some college groups, there were a lot of adult groups, and then somewhere between like the ages of what, 22 and 40, people just disappeared. Like that happened a lot. And where did they go? Well, they started getting families, they started getting married, they started thinking, how do I raise my child? Um, how do you teach a kid morality? Well, I better send him to church. Or I better start going to church, even if I don't believe this stuff. I think what one of the things we have to do as a movement is provide a place to have like these bigger discussions. How do, uh, having like a Sunday school for atheists, where you talk about ethical questions, or why is it good to tell the truth? Have those discussions with children and parents. Um, I've started to see a lot of atheist conventions have childcare, so that you could bring your family there and leave your kids there, and they're safe. Because otherwise, you know, a lot of places, why are your kids going to sit through a big lecture? They're not. So that's one thing. I, there's books out now that talk about how to be an atheist parent. There, I'm sure there are going to be books that talk about how to date as an atheist, because that's a whole nother world that we haven't really explored a lot. Um, books about like growing up as an atheist. Those are starting to happen. Like you look at the Christian, there are Christian bookstores. They're not atheist bookstores. Because all, right now, all the books that are about atheism are about does God exist? Why is Christianity bad? And like, that's it. That's going to start to spread. So there's a lot of places we got to go. Um, and I think you can do that without openly trying to convince people or beating them over the heads with why you should be an atheist. We don't need to. That's going to happen automatically. But now what we need to do is take those people who are atheists and make them feel comfortable with it. Like make them feel like they can have a family and have rites of passage growing, going through life that don't involve religion. Um, how many weddings have people been through where there was no mention of religion? I can't tell you the last one I was at like that had, but some people are starting to have those. Um, and they can say, look, here are my wedding vows. It has nothing to do with religion. I saw two people like, they took two chemicals and they, like, were, they looked clear, but then they mixed them together and it turned blue and it was like the most beautiful thing you've ever seen. <laughs> like, cool, like more of that. So I think that's where it's gonna go and that's where it should go. And yeah, you're gonna see some stuff that like, oh, this person's like bad for the movement or they're saying things that they shouldn't be, whatever, that's gonna happen, whatever. Yeah? I would expect that the library and the elementary and high school grades would be deficient in books by atheists. I think that's an area that should be checked. Sure. So a lot of times, at least at the high school level, in order to get a book into a high school library, it needs to have like book reviews in a couple different places. And especially, I, I don't know if it's like book reviews aimed at kids, like not the New York Times book review, but like a certain type of book review that says, this is an interesting book, you should have it available for kids. But you can always talk to your local high schools and say, look, if you will take it, We'd be glad to donate, you know, copies of these books to the school library, and you could see if they'll take it. Um, pressure to keep them out. Yeah, there may be pressure to keep them out, but again, you this is where it, it, you have to do your research because every high school is different. You got to find out what books do they have there that deal with religious issues. 
Do they have like pro-Christianity books? I mean, I know the argument you hear from uh, Christian organizations a lot is, look, they have all these books about being tolerant about GLBT students, so we should have books that say you're going to hell if you're gay or whatever, because it's balanced. But like, whatever, those books are not reviewed. Those, the argument that the schools give is the books that these Christian groups are suggesting <coughs> They are not reviewed by the same sources. They don't get the positive reviews that say this is good for kids to read, even for the sake of discussion. That's why some of those books are kept out. So you gotta make sure that you know the books that you wanna offer are legit books, that it passes whatever smell test the library at the school has. Do you know of any? Um, I'm, I'm wondering off the top of my head if uh, Dawkins' The Magic of Reality is a good one. Um, what else? I mean, there's a, there's a bunch of books out there that just that go beyond Does God Exist and talk about the stuff at a level that kids can understand. What was another one? Someone suggested? Hey, yeah, good luck with that. <laughs> but uh, but there, are, there are a few books that aim to explain science, that explain like logical stuff, that don't just go saying like, look, God doesn't exist, or that, that aren't that controversial for those kids. But they go to the heart of like reason and logic, and hey, let's get those books in there because I don't know why any library would oppose that. Demon yeah, demon. I mean, I'm, I would be surprised if a lot of libraries tried to ban Carl Sagan from a library. Maybe Richard Dawkins. I could see them putting up a fight, depending on which book we're talking about. But again, a lot of his books are about science. I think it's over a lot of those kids' heads, but not all of them. Yeah. So you mentioned. You Yeah. Have you seen, so as a math teacher, you don't really bring religion into your classroom. Right. But have you seen other teachers in other areas, in your specific high school, that uh, won't necessarily teach religion, but will actually somehow incorporate into the... I, you know what? Our school is fantastic about, if there's one thing we do, we, we follow the law about that stuff. I have never heard a story in the years I've been there um, even in our district, which is three high schools, of anyone pushing religion in the classroom, because I, I just don't think they would get a job at our school if we knew that was part of their agenda. Now, it's always possible the teacher gets the job and then they try to do that stuff, but frankly, we would, you would find out about that. The word would travel so quickly from the students, because there's so many students there, even if they are religious, they would frown upon that sort of thing. And I, as much as I live in a conservative, very Republican, very red part of the state, uh, in that suburb, a lot of the kids, even the religious ones, they know what the rules are about that sort of thing, and they would report on it the second a teacher did something like that, which is good. So I, I haven't experienced that, and I don't think it would happen at my school. For what it's worth, uh, there was a, a court case that made national news several years ago at our school where a child wanted to wear a shirt on the day of silence that said, be happy, not gay. and. Uh, the school said you can't wear that, it's disruptive or it's wrong or whatever. And the ACLU sided with the kid. They said yes he can, that's not a hate-filled shirt. He's allowed to express his view, he won the case. Um, I think he won a dollar, because uh, it wasn't about the money. But, um, that would, but for the most part I haven't seen our school get in any of those sort of predicaments. Cool, well um, I think we're doing a dinner thing after this, so thank you again. <laughs>